Welcome back to the Scarlet Faithful Podcast. I'm Aaron Brightman coming to you on Monday, October 16th, back with David Anderson, uh, a special edition of reacting to Saturday's wild, raucous 18-point fourth quarter comeback for Rutgers over Michigan State. Uh, wanted to uh, have David on to get his reaction and just talk some uh, implications of this win. David, thanks so much for being back. And initially, what was your reaction to Rutgers pulling off what really was an improbable comeback in the fourth quarter? Well, thanks for having me, Aaron. We always got to give the audience what they want. And right now, I think the fan base is on a high, like you said, after just a thrilling victory. It was very bizarre. I can only even compare it to one game as in my fandom. Uh, maybe two, if you want to count the Virginia Tech game, which in the 50 to 49 game, which I was, I didn't watch live. I think we watched it on uh, like the next morning on the tape delay. But uh, the only other one close to this was when they beat Indiana in 2015, because yep. it was you a period of despair. Same exact thing happened where Indiana, in that case, they snapped the punt over the punter's head, the, and then Rutgers recovered for a touchdown. And then by halfway through the fourth quarter, Rutgers was in control. In that game, they bled, bled the clock out a little more, but they had already tied – in that game, they had already tied it by middle of the fourth quarter. And it was just like the blink of an eye, an entire deficit had been erased. That was the only thing I could possibly compare it to. Um, that being said – when you talk about it and think about it after the fact, it's like they weren't getting totally dominated up to that point. So you felt like I, – I'll admit, and I'll te te put this on the air. I did text Aaron during the game, and I'm like, it's over, basically, <laughs> right before. And then literally minutes. It might have even been before he read the text. There was the fumble on the Michigan State punt. I, I got into my house. I saw that the Rutgers had scored – and it was just shocking. I mean, what I know you kind of gave your instant reaction, but like what was going through your head about just that craziness that happened in like a period of five to six minutes of game time? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm still in a little bit of disbelief that, that they actually won that game. It, it, this game to me was like, I mean, they played – they did play rather poorly and it was disappointing how flat they came out. I, I think, but it was such a momentum game. I mean, it's a little cliche, but like, you know, I went back and looked at it because Rutgers was, was, it was a seven, six game when Tyreen Powell had that ejection for the, yeah. the very, very, very questionable targeting call. It was seven to six. They were getting the ball back. Like they hadn't played great, but they were still very much in control. There was oh, just over four minutes left in the first half. So as soon as that happened, everything went to hell and that happened so quick. And it was like, next thing you know, oh my God, like they're getting blown out at home. And then yeah. the reverse happened in the fourth quarter. So it, it was, yeah, it, it was as strange of a just flow of a game as I can remember. And, um, but it was, uh, yeah, it, it was so wild how quickly, you know, and I, I remembered how Michigan state blew uh, things at the end of the Iowa game. And I, you know, when they did get that pump return, you did start to wonder. I tweeted, you know, I'm not going to say it. And people right, misinterpreted right, it thinking right. I was like, you know, being critical. It was like, I just, you felt maybe. But honestly, at that point, if you actually thought Rutgers was going to win the game, I mean, more power to you. But I, they hadn't given you a lot of reasons to believe that that was actually going to happen. Right. Yeah. I mean, in, in when I was thinking about it, uh, kind of in the first half, you always look at that very first drive and Michigan State march right down the field to score. But we talked about this before, and we saw it against Indiana even last year, where sometimes a team goes right down on you in the first first drive, and like it's not really indicative of the rest of the game. I mean, right. I, as a fan, unfortunately, of the New York Jets, the only time they've been a good first drive team is when Adam Gase was their coach, and they would score in the first drive and do nothing else. And yep. that was kind of like, well – it doesn't necessarily mean much. So the fact that they then got two field goals out of it, they were moving the ball. I thought Wimsett, even though he wasn't great, like to your point, I felt like he had a little bit of a rhythm. Like he, yeah. he felt, it felt okay with how he was playing. Um, you know, the conditions were bad. I mean, when you looked around the college football landscape, especially as the day went on and I thought more about it and I was Crazy. watching 
every game in like the eastern half of the country seemed like it was in terrible weather, both on the NFL yesterday and in college on Saturday. Like the Maryland game, there was just some wild things that were happening. And so that said, I mean, I guess I just want to pivot to one other thing uh, before I forget, because I listened to a lot of the Michigan State uh, beat writers because they're actually great for content. You can find plenty of pregame, postgame analysis, all this stuff. And pretty much the consensus was they were discussing, did Michigan State just quit or did they get beat? And what the most encouraging thing was that the general consensus from their, uh, you know, beat writers and things was they got beat. And so that's probably the most encouraging thing as a Rutgers fan is that even with all the adversity, it the other team didn't just like throw in the towel, even in a tight game. Like they just got outplayed in the end. And we can talk about a lot of it. A lot of it came to our case to the game. So many of those things showed up. And, but at the end of the day, the consensus is like, we got beat by a team with equal or perhaps inferior talent, partially because they wanted it more late and partially because they just outplayed us in that fourth quarter. Yeah, great point. How do you feel about it? Do you feel like Rutgers beat them or do you feel like Michigan State just kind of beat themselves, I guess? No, I I, I think that, um, I mean, the special teams plays were obviously, you know, self-inflicted to a degree by Michigan State. But again, as a Rutgers fan, it's like when you see them take advantage of those mistakes, that's what's so encouraging because so many times before over the years, you know, we've seen things kind of be on a silver platter for them and they can't take advantage of it. So this team has been very good all year, I think of taking advantage of mistakes. Um, But what I thought was as, as kind of wham, bam, the comeback was, you know, the fact that all three phases, you know, did play a key part in winning. I mean, the defense getting two, three and outs, the special teams obviously making those plays. Um, But I really, I, I go back to that offensive drive where they got the ball on their own 27 You know, I think it almost like as uh, it it gets maybe underplayed for me, that was the kind of moment of the game. All these other plays were huge, but for them to be down 11, 12 minutes to go, and they march down the field and whims it, you know, to your point earlier. I mean, that first quarter, he he was making elite throws and then he got thrown off his, you know, he did get thrown off his rhythm and you called it with those interceptions up the middle. You know, if he, if he sailed it a little bit, that was a perfect call by you in the pregame. But, um, he made he made some tremendous throws on that drive. Obviously, Manungai just turned into an absolute beast. The offensive line, you know, it kind of it was like Flaherty brought the Giants from the Super Bowl days on the field. I mean, they were dominating on that drive. Then, yeah. It, it just, uh, I, I that to me was almost in a way the most encouraging thing. How the offense seized the opportunity and helped win that game in a way that you know we've been waiting for them. And and with wins, it you know in passing situations down two scores to Michigan and Wisconsin, they, they, they ended up making key mistakes. Right. But in this moment down two scores with the game on the line, the Rutgers offense came through. And I think long-term in terms of the rest of the season, that might really be a, you know, have a huge impact on them the rest of the way. And I know we wanted to talk about short uh, kind of, you know, internal implications and external implications of this win. So let's kind of delve off of that into what this means for the team right now and what the impact it could have moving forward. Sure. So I'll kind of join what you were just saying with where we're going. The play for me of the game was second and 15 on that drive you're talking about, because, you know, second and 15 down by 11 points, it's in the fourth quarter, knowing what we know now, maybe you're running with Manunga, he gets eight and he gets eight again on third, like maybe. (laughs) Right. But at the time, Wimsett, everybody in the stadium knows you're passing. And they ran a pretty deep concept. They basically cleared it out for Isaiah Washington in the middle against Cal Halliday, who I said is vulnerable at pass coverage. And Washington caught it, kind of evaded a little bit of pressure, and he kind of ran around people. There was a, That was kind of a theme of the entire fourth quarter. It seemed yeah. like Michigan State was taking – I don't know what they were doing, but it seemed like Rutgers was like running backwards or sideways and then around the outside, and it was like, what are they doing? But once he hit that pass, there were some other incomplete passes on that drive. Yeah. Drops, poor throws. I know he missed Dremel. He hit him in the hand, but it was a bad throw. Yeah. But right after one of those incompletions – Manunga ripped off a big run. And I think it's because Michigan State was like they had to respect the pass or 
they were almost run blitzing in the hopes that they were going to get to the quarterback and rush a throw. But it was because of the threat of the pass that they had to change their tactics. Yep. And that from that point on, they on that drive, they had no idea what was coming. And then if they did, they were both tired and just out of sorts. So to how that feeds into well, the future of this is several fold. One, you can talk all you want that, you know, your team can make a comeback, whatever. You got to do it. And they did it. You got to do it against a power five team. And we'll talk more about that in terms of the longer term implications. But Michigan State, like we said, this is a team with the fifth or sixth most, quote, talent on their roster in the Big Ten. And it's hard. To, it's hard to argue that. Right. But you did it right. You did it against this team who has beat you eight out of nine. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not they beat them once, but eight out of nine times you've lost to this team. And so the fact that I'm sure doubt was creeping into their heads a little bit in the locker room, just as it was in ours. But the fact that you were able to string together that drive and then absolutely just punish them at the very end. I mean, Chiano was totally right about like now they can believe one more level of chop. Right. You tell it to them. It's like, OK, I see how this is helping me in my in the classroom. I see how it's helping me in my everyday life. I see how this helped us against, you know, Virginia Tech or whatever. But this is a team that's beaten you eight of nine that these guys were around the program for. Like a lot of those losses against Virginia Tech, we remember them. These kids weren't even born yet. Right. So the fact that 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 belief is there, I think, is going to go a long, a long way for the coaching staff as well as the players. And we talk about it over and over again. You got to keep extending your season. You got to keep moving it forward so that guys are focused in, in film study. They're focused when they're lifting those weights on Tuesday. They're focused, you know, into the little details because that's how Rutgers won this game. Those little details are what ended up getting them over the top. And now they should have an added focus on that. You know, at least if they win next week, it's going to be for the rest of the year. Yeah. And the fact that the way they did it, right. We're like, it really took one play to, to flip everything in terms of momentum and how, and I loved how Shiano kind of, you know, spoke about had the force of momentum and how that really carried them through. And that goes to the details, like you said, you know, and, and, and one play leads to two plays, leads to three plays and they lived it. And I, I, I think that, you know, it, it, it can, it also just keeps them so much more, you know, they, I said it in my recap, like it, my reaction, like, you worried at 24 to six, right? In such a big game, arguably the biggest game in, in years for the program. They came out flat. If they lost that game in the manner in which they were losing it, it, it really had, I think, a chance to derail the rest of the season, right? You start to have doubt creep in. Right. And, and and certainly the fan base would have reacted pretty ugly, uh, pretty disappointedly. Um, but the, the, the whole reverse effect of that now, where they're all going to be bought in. I mean, you're bought in for the rest of the season now, no doubt because you're only one win away. And even, God forbid, if they lose against Indiana, you're still just one win away. Right. You're going to be locked in the rest of the season. Obviously, Indiana is the best opportunity by a long shot. But at the same time, you had to get five before you get six. And it was it, this in its own right is a hurdle that the program hasn't jumped over in a while. So, it, I, yeah, I think it's it's so big for the locker room and for the belief of everything. Yeah, I mean – to your point, it's kind of like the same thing with a lot of NFL. Like all of our listeners probably watch the Bills Giants game and then the Jets Eagles. Pretty much, probably everyone that's watching this show watched at least one of those two games, probably. And you saw in both of those games that in neither neither game did one team just kind of take the advantage of it in the fourth quarter. The between the Bills Eagles Jets Giants and the Rutgers did, and I know it's I got the college level, but like they did seize the opportunity. And so that's actually better, makes you feel more confident than if they would have came in, they, you know, let's say they win 24 to 10. It's never in doubt. Let's say it's the Northwestern game all over again. You'd be like, well, it's great that we won, but conditions are bad. Their quarterback was missing his first start. You saw him before the game. He had the hoodie on like he was going ice fishing, as uh, I heard one commentator point out. And I'm like, if they can just get this guy – having some self-doubt in his first career start, he's freezing his butt off. You can yeah. tell before the game, like then it's going to give you so much. And the fact that they had to come back and face adversity is going to make a much bigger impact than, like I said, if they would have just 
beat them like they beat Northwestern 27, 24-10 or whatever, and it was never right. really in doubt. Be like, yeah, bad weather conditions. They're having a good season. Michigan State's a mess. This is this is actually much better for how those guys feel inside about like, hey, we stuck together and we came back regardless of you know any other factors. Yeah, very very true. My last point on internal is just kind of to that in terms of how they won it. You know, like we keep talking about the identity of this team and, you know, defense and, and running the ball. But re- really, this kind of had the, the identity of the team bubble up, which is they're, this is a tough team. And and, right. and they've taken right. on the personality, Shiano. And, you know, I'm thinking about it like with guys like Christian Dremel, Johnny Lang, and, you know, even Wimsey, right? You know, I mean, he was a high-level recruit, but he's gone through a ton of adversity in his career. Reggie Sutton now starting offensive line. Um, you know, some of the guys on defense, I mean, even Aaron Lewis at times, you know, kind of his story, all the adversity he's gone through that there, there, there's, these guys are tough, you know, and, and, and they're mentally tough. They're, they're physically tough on the field. They hold up physically in a way that Rutgers hasn't held up in the big 10 possibly ever, even 2014, they weren't built like a big 10 team. Right. So for me, that, that is just, it, it all plays into it, right? The way they, in which they won just feeds kind of what I think is the strength of this team is a bunch of just, you know, uh, blue collar guys that are a bit of underdogs that have just continued to battle. Uh, and, and I think, again, that there's plays into such a positive for the rest of the way. For sure. I mean, it, the one thing too, that, I mean, I kind of want to talk about Reggie Sutton. We haven't talked about him. And yeah. so when you watch it, He's a really good player. Yeah. He's got great footwork, clearly knows what he's doing. There was a play, the touchdown to Isaiah Washington, which was, you could say should have thrown it to Dremel, but, I mean, that was an unbelievable throw to yeah. Washington in the back of the end zone. On that play, Reggie Sutton should have been beaten. Somehow the defensive end got around him, and I don't know how he pushed him just far enough for Wimsett to have the time to step into that throw, because if he doesn't step into that throw, it's picked. Yeah. Right. But I don't know how he got a hand on the guy because when you watch Sutton, I mean, again, his initial pops, okay, but he doesn't have the agility. That's what he's lost. He can't like block anybody downfield. He can't like react. If there's like a secondary pressure, he, he can't. And teams are going to expose this in the end of the season. Just write it down. Like they're, there's no way he's going to – he'll get probably a little bit more agility, but he's not going to be the Reggie Sutton that we saw four years ago. Right. right. So – but he had it just enough. And so to see that, and if you're one of the other offensive linemen, when you talk about a developmental program, right, and I know the term's overused, cliche, blah, 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 right? But the whole point is that the guys get tougher, they get smarter, and they face adversity as they're going through this journey of football, which is supposed to be a microcosm of life, right? You're a guy like Kyle Manungai, Christian Dremel. You're not starting. Nothing's handed to you. You're not on the too deep, nothing. And you have to work your way up through the ranks, which, yeah, there might be some guys who are lower on the depth chart who transfer out, but you have to accept that because they're seeing like, hey, our team's winning. This work is paying off. And that's why we're saying at this point, you got to make a bowl now. Because you have to show that that progress is continuing to build. And so to see those guys go through that adversity, that it was never easy for them, that builds your character and your teammates see it and the younger players see it and they see that that's why this is so important. And last comment on that kind of train of thought is like, Shiano talks about this all the time. They don't expect your freshman to play. Really, they don't even care what position the guy's playing. It's a whole, the whole thing is to get acclimated to college life and college athletics, you know, being on the schedule, having study hall, all that sort of stuff. And so by having your seniors and upperclassmen showing the way and showing that this is the culmination of all the work that they've done, it kind of lets those guys see like, okay, I don't have to transfer to eventually reach either my NFL dreams or the best that I can be at this level. There's so many of those things and you can have success all you want, win press conferences, whatever, but until you do it on the field, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't get to that next level that they needed to be at to advance as a program. Yeah. Th- that's an amazing point. And uh, yeah, it just speaks to, we've talked about, you know, the leadership uh, internally with the, with the players. And then obviously this coaching staff, we think really highly of, and, and you just nailed it in terms of, of kind of the, the, the growth uh, w- within 
of where this program is going. Let's now talk about the external implications in terms of perception, in terms of what this does for the program long term uh, after this win. Well, let's just talk about a tale of two weeks. Like you look at the situation with Wisconsin and they beat Rutgers, even though, again, like we said, we think the defense will play pretty even, but their quarterback won the game, basically. Tanner Mordecai. He gets injured against Iowa and their offense can't do anything. Imagine if that happened against Rutgers a week ago, what conversation we might be having now, right? Like people would be looking back at that as like, Hey, but we will remember, but nobody on the outside is going to remember that. A a recruit is not going to remember that five years from now. It's going to be like Rutgers has right now five and two next to their name in the standings. And, you know, Michigan state doesn't. And, you know, Maryland lost a clunker. They played probably their worst game of the year. I doubt they'll play worse than that. And they are right next to Rutgers in the standings right now, five and two. After all the good hype that they got for the first month of the season, we're in the same exact place as they are right now. From now on, we control our own destiny as to whether we finish ahead of Maryland or not. Mm-hmm. Right. And so on the outside, if you're a recruit, I think this does a couple things. First of all, we avoid doomsday. Because the key thing with Rutgers is they keep having to bring players in that, 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 you know, can help build their program. And so you avoid the collapse of like your recruiting class completely falling apart, barring something weird, right? You got to five wins. All of these recruits couldn't have expected more than that. From a national perspective, from a, you can't, now you can't negatively recruit against Rutgers. Like sure, positive recruiting might not be that impacted, but you know, another team can't go, Michigan State can't come in here and be like, well, we were a mess. And we still beat these guys. Like <laughs> when you're competing against teams like that for recruits or like a Syracuse, you know, they're like, yeah, well, we got smoked this week, but look at what Rutgers did. Like there's that, that negativity is probably, a, I mean, sure, you could lose to Indiana and, and lose some of that, but you got to five wins. You beat three power five teams so far this year. You got a chance for a couple more and to be, you know, have the most of any team in Rutgers history if things all break perfectly for you. And even if they don't, you win one more and you're still one of the better teams, you know, in terms of, you know, beating top end competition in the history of the program. So, I mean, those are just some of the things that, you know, from an outside perspective, nobody knows about these nuances. Nobody's going to remember it was a monsoon, but next to your name, you got five wins right now and only two losses. I mean, do you see kind of some of those as the same or do you see like, that is a is it bigger or smaller than what the way I'm talking about it in your mind? No, well, yeah, I mean, and you're, you're talking specifically power five wins within the program, which you know is significant. Um, you know, some people might you know quibble over the fact that they're not the best power five teams, but that is historically significant and, and important in terms of you know the whole argument of Rutgers doesn't belong in the Big Ten. Rutgers isn't a power five program. Well, if you go out, this team beats four or five teams. They've already won three. They went four or five is some of the most ever. Uh, that's a significant right. statement. Um, I've been honestly just more surprised by, I, I mean, as a fan base, we're more critical of our, it, it's like your family, right? You're the most critical of yourself. And, and you should be, right? That's what leads yes. to success. Right. Yeah. That's true. But th- there really has been a positive turn in perception this season within the Big Ten in terms of the media that covers the Big Ten, other fan bases. And this win was crucial to kind of keeping that moving forward. A loss would have been, oh, well, you know, it would have been you know, he, same old Rutgers. Uh, right. And then you worry about things snowballing. So to win that game and now be on the cusp of a bowl game. And I, I do think, you know, just because I think Indiana is a must win because I think that not just me, it's not just about making a bowl game. I think the statement of being six and two, three and two in the Big Ten by the end of October, having that bye week to kind of soak it in, get healthy keeps everybody positive, but also the perception of you ride that two week high going into a monster game against Ohio state or get national talk, you know, Rutgers will just get so much positive press out of this. You got to capitalize on the momentum now you have for Michigan state. But, but that being said, also, I think just the fact that there's such good vibes around the program outside of the program, uh, I think probably will definitely since 2014, but, um, it's just really important for, for so many reasons and, and showing that Shiano 2.0, like you can't really debate it now. Shiano 2.0 is heading and in the right direction right now, where if they right. lost that game, 
it's kind of the opposite where you start to right. wonder, are they ever going to get over that hump? Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, kind of what I was alluding to earlier is I was looking back and I would love anybody who's, you know, the research or wants to put the hat on. And I was looking back at it while I was, you know, five o'clock in the morning, holding a sleeping child in my arm who wouldn't want to go <laughs> in the crib. And it was dawned on me and I was like, okay, how many power five teams that are in the power five now? did Rutgers beat in that 2006 season? Yep. And the answer is six. They won six games against teams that are currently in the power five. And then I'm like, okay, well, how many times have they ever done anything close to that? And the answer is they won five in 2014 because they beat Washington state. And then they won their three, three big 10 games. And then they beat North Carolina in a bowl. Right. Those are the only two times in Rutgers history that they beat two that they beat five or more teams that are in power five conferences today. Now, again, you can wow. quibble about the fact that, you know, my alma mater Penn, you know, Rutgers beat them in 1961 and they were still like a pretty big time program playing against Notre Dame, you know, whatever. But like, if you look at the programs that have survived the tests of college football so far, like Rutgers has not had the success. They beat four several times in the eighties, several, including I believe 1988 when they beat Penn State and Michigan State. Michigan State was the defending Big Ten champions, and yep. they beat them in the season opener the following year. So yep. in the 80s, this is why in the 80s when we look back, what's the difference between 80s and 90s? They were knocking off some of these teams, and that's what kind of set up their move to the Big East in football and having some early success under Doug Graber because even if you lost occasionally to a lesser team, you could see the sign that, like, hey, we can hang with bigger teams by winning these games. And we haven't seen it enough in the last decade. And that's one of the reasons that the program has been so poorly perceived. You know, a frequent member of the ESPN bottom 10 versus this year, where when I was looking at the surprises in college football so far, Rutgers was on the list this morning. If yeah. they lose that game, they're not. Right. And I right. don't think it really matters in the grand scheme of like, we don't care. But somebody out there reading is going to notice that. And they'll be like, oh, how about Rutgers? Right. They're like, we went through the same thing in basketball a couple of years ago. And I wanted to ask you about that is like, do you feel like there's some of the same vibes as like maybe Peichel's second year, you know, yeah. or so maybe even third year. I know it's a different sport and it's a lot more independent games that you can kind of lean on, but do you feel like the positive vibes on the program kind of have the same flavor as they did with the Peichel? Well, I, I, I think, you know, I think with any coach, right you have a certain window where you're selling a positive message and you don't necessarily have to have the results to back it up where you come to a crossroads where, right. all right, it's kind of, you know, you got to show up and you got to prove that everything you've been selling and, and preaching is it going to make for better results on the field. And with Paykel, you're right. Year two, Madison Square Garden, that was the first sign like, hey, things might actually get better here. And each year there was like a little bit of like some crumbs of, hey, things are starting to get better before that uh, 1920 season where right. they won the 20 games. And then you like really started to believe and they, they were able to build success after that. So, yes, I do think that like being year four for Shiano, like this was so critical in that, you know, if you can't get to six wins now, if you can't do it in year four, when you're, you know, you're midway of your contract, midway of your tenure, um, you, you have your best recruiting class, you know, rankings wise, since you've been back, you have, you, you've worked so hard to generate this positive momentum. If you can't then back it up on the field, you're going to start to get picked apart a little bit by that negative recruiting you're talking about, by unrest by the fan base, you know, uh, and, and so I think now you're so close to kind of sealing that. And, you know, with next year too, this is a little bit of a different year too, because big 10, you know, you have those four pack 12 teams coming in. Yes. The East goes away, but it's like, if there, we, we know how many articles there would be this off season. If they right, can't get right. to six wins in a bowl game, how many articles are there going to be? And I'm not going to write one, but I'll have to cover it in some way, but when are they going to get over the hump? Are they ever going to do it? And you don't want those kind of questions out there in this off season. And they're, they put themselves now in a position to a, it's kind of twofold. It's a, the, the guys that you touched on that have worked so hard to put the program in a position can walk through that door now and achieve it. And then B, you know, now you've created momentum for the future and show that, hey, everything I've been selling, everything I've been saying, like in tenure one is happening in tenure two, it's time to get on board. So I think it's, it's 
I, it's cliche to say this game's the turning point, but I honestly, and I did write about it before that I thought these two games were a seminal moment. I really think it's true. I think that we may look back on it, you know, hopefully knock on wood right, two or three right. years from now when this team's winning seven games, eight games, going to bowl game every year, that this was when kind of things clicked and all of a sudden things change. Yeah. I mean, when I look at the Shiano 1.0 tenure and we stormed the field against Pitt in 2005, I think it was right. Cause that was the first time they went to the bowl. Yeah. And People don't remember that, like, that pit team was kind of a mess at that point. They actually kind of like Virginia Tech this year. They kind of righted the ship after they played Rutgers. Yeah. And now that Virginia Tech win is looking way better as they yeah. continue to play well. Two and but, one in the see. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> – and so you look back and it's like you need you need those moments that you can hang your hat on, especially because we talk about, like, yeah, it's a moving goalpost. That's the reality of life. Like the fact that we came into the season expecting four wins and thinking that might be good enough. Well, once we they won the first game, and then of course once they beat Virginia Tech, we're like, okay, that's not good enough anymore. Right. You got to do more. And then sure, looking at this Indiana game, sure you could call it a must win or a can't lose or whatever you want. And I think I think uh, a lot of people have covered it quite well on their podcasts. You know, whether it be Greg Ritchie and Mike in the the post game or several of our other friends who have podcasts that uh, that talk about Rutgers. But it's like, you never know what's going to happen. We could be in another monsoon against Indiana next week. Wimsack goes down. Yep. We could play a game like I, – or we could play the same game against Iowa that Wisconsin did where somebody gets hurt or something bizarre happens or they throw for more than 37 yards. They, they throw all of a sudden they're completing passes that we didn't know they had in them. Like, any of these things could happen. And so that's why it's always a – it's always a revolving door of expectations. Like they move up a little bit, they move back a little bit. And yeah, we can say that's illogical, but that's just how humans are. Right. And so, you know, we don't know what's going to happen against Indiana. That's why the thing about Wagner was, I just need them to win that game and to be over. What if the game got canceled? Like <laughs> what if there was like, I don't know, uh, you know, the stadium had a construction issue and they never made up the game. Like you, you never know. So yeah. you, it's like, now the schedule has broken in a way that the opportunity is there. And we were texting during the game, like how many times have Rutgers even been close to be in a position to, ex- to, to accept these mistakes, yeah. fumbling a punt. I mean, that guy was their backup punter sort of because the other punter was benched from his lack of directional punting last week. So it's like that was internal turmoil. And that was set up the first, uh, the fumble because – they had an a, a illegal formation, right? And Rutgers probably should have taken the yards mathematically, but Shiano was like re kick it, and at the time I was like, "What?" <laughs> like I, I, that's what I would say to you. So, he deserves major credit for that because without that call, it doesn't. It might not have ever happened. Right. I mean, I think knowing what we know now in hindsight, like I do think Rutgers was in a position to start moving the ball downfield, but. Yeah. You, you can't expect that to not be a huge momentum because it was all about momentum. And they were starting to stop him at that point and kind of right the ship. But, yeah, I mean, maybe we're in a dogfight in the last 30 seconds because of that, going for a field goal or something. But, uh, like, all those little things where Michigan State was not buttoned up, like we talked about, like their coaches, and I feel so bad for their players, you know, as I wrote in Off Tackle Empire this weekend when we were talking about the game, like their players played hard. But they, they got a little bit let down by their coaches, and eventually they just kind of wore out on defense. Like, how many times have we seen that story? And yeah. to their credit, they did take advantage of Rutgers' mistakes for the most part, and they still lost. Yeah. Like, that's that's how crazy that game was. So no one's going to remember those parts of it other than us and some of the – like, I don't think anyone's going to donate an extra million dollars because they won that game. But if you have the students, like uh, uh, the Rutgers is now undefeated at home, right? One thing that is undersold in this whole dilemma we've been in in the last 10 years is not winning enough home games. Like when I was a student, I didn't go to Rutgers. But my friends who did, like going to a home game, you expected to at least be competitive. And it was the thing. They went until last year beating Indiana. They had lost how many consecutive home Big Ten games? Yeah, I was like Like, – 21 it's a ridiculous streak. They hadn't won since 2017. So yeah, now you've beaten three power five teams 
at home. Yep. So if you're a student, I know the weather was bad this game, but you're like, all right, we're going to go to the next game, right? Like we're, this is a part of my experience at Rutgers is going to home football games. I'm going to wake up earlier. I'm going to get ready for the game. I'm not going to just show up, like maybe roll out of bed, maybe not if I've had a few too many drinks the night before. Like this is part of their experience. And that's also how you breed, you know, big picture, lifelong donors, tailgaters, that you don't have in this sort of gap between people who are my age, maybe a little younger and the current students, because for so long, it was such a struggle. And now, you know, the people who are, have kids who are 30 to 40, 35 to 40 years old, they're the ones who are donating money to the program. Now that they have it, and even though they can't go to games and those are the type of things that you need to stack these wins on. None of them are in a vacuum. Like if you win this game, and you went three and nine this year, we wouldn't, it wouldn't matter in the big picture. But the fact that it's part of a bigger puzzle is what's so encouraging. I mean, you could talk probably about your experience. You were from the previous generation of deprived students. Mm -hmm. And, you know, probably the number of people you know who are tailgaters is much lower than my age, just because they had more success my college years that uh, the program yeah. had. Well, I was going to say, you know, uh, that I was definitely in, in, in my college experience, you know, I was pretty much one of many that stayed at the tailgate and didn't actually right. go into the state. I went to plenty of games, believe me, but towards the end, like my senior year, they won one game. They beat Syracuse, you know, on the last second field goal. So, uh, you know, more times than not, you you ended up staying outside because the tailgate scene's always been great at Rutgers. Right. But uh, to your point, you know, I think people have been clamoring for a signature win. And someone said to me this weekend, oh, this is a signature win. It's not a signature win. It's a swing game. It's a, it's a potential turning point for the program, but it's not a signature win. But to your, what you just said, even if they won this game and they you know, go three and nine, it doesn't have the same impact, which A is why Indiana is so important, but also winning those winnable games. I mean, when's the last time? Probably 2014, you could say, was the last time Rutgers – won all their matchup kind of 50 50 games the ones on paper at the beginning of the season you said okay they can win these games you could argue penn state maybe 2014 franklin's first year they obviously should have won that game yeah but i don't know if that's a you know uh, i would usually say it's like all your winnable games minus one because right. there's always going to be a clunker in there right which is why they're so close to winning every game that's why this is so terrifying also it's their eighth game in a row Right before by, but they obviously that's why a loss here. You could see how things could have potentially snowballed, and now they got to walk through that door. And, and and just like you said, things can still happen. November's a brutal schedule. Their next three games after this one's the opponents are eighteen and one. You, you got you got to close the door right now and, and eliminate any possibility of because every loss is just going to compound the pressure of having to get that sixth win. You have a golden opportunity here, but my long winded point is. You know, even if you have a season where you just you win all the games that on paper you thought you could win, that then is the huge. Forward. Yes, even if yes. it's four, even if it's five. Like, would you even? I would even argue there. maybe that's more important than just one signature win and a four and eight season. You know, it, yes, we all want to beat Penn State, we all want to beat Iowa on the road, but if you get to six wins, there's so much benefit in that. And then I, it's almost like you have to crawl before you walk. You know, if you can win those winnable games. Then you can start to talk about, you know, when, getting those upsets. And maybe, listen, maybe they beat Indiana, and then maybe they do go to Iowa City and they pull a stunner because, uh, you know, they, they, they got to that point where they were taking care of business first. It just doesn't happen overnight, especially in football, as you know. It's not like basketball where on any given night pretty much anybody can win. Right. Football, it's so much different. So, so much that goes into every single game, and that's what made that game so compelling. But, right. I, yeah, I think it's kind of mutually exclusive because – Signature wins matter because you can go back like and look at the Michigan State 2004 game. And yeah. and yeah, it meant something. The, it, it meant something. Like that like I was talking about the people who are my age. That was my freshman year. My friends who were not as big of Rutgers fans as me but were students, that was the first game they ever went to. I came back from Boston for that game, by the way. I drove down and, and uh, went to that game. That was amazing. Yeah, but that's also like, – you can. But, it's like a marker in the sand, right, of the Shiano right. era. But then they didn't win enough games that year for right. it to be like they didn't win all the games they were supposed to win. I mean, they lost next week as we all know. But it's like <laughs> those two things are, 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 are almost mutually exclusive because a, a signature win usually isn't the game you're supposed to win. 
but you also have to develop the consistency of beating the teams that you can beat. And so, you know, that's where this Iowa thing is kind of a blessing in disguise, right? Because Wisconsin losing to Iowa means that Iowa probably will still be ranked in four weeks, barring something weird. I think they have a bye and then they have Northwestern. Yeah, right? they have so, a, yeah, they're going to be favored in every game the rest of the way, probably. Right. So, so it's like if they're ranked and you get that, no one's going to remember that. Like, well, that Iowa team's offense was trash. Like, you beat a ranked team. If yeah. if that that that's why it would be a signature win, and this Michigan State game won't be, even right. though Michigan State's a better team, they should have beat Iowa. They outgained them by a hundred yards. Like they they won everything except points in their yeah. game against Iowa. But no one's going to consider this Michigan State like a signature win, whereas they they're probably a, they're a better team on paper and they're a better, more talented team. But I was just a more buttoned up outfit than Michigan State, so that will be interesting. The other thing with Michigan State, we, we shouldn't belittle them too much because their four losses this year, their opponents are combined twenty two and two, yeah. or t- no twenty two and four, right? Something like that. Because yeah. Rutgers has two losses. Iowa has one. Washington State. has One of them has one, and then they lost to uh, – Excuse me, Washington. They lost to Washington. Washington, right? And yeah. then they lost one other game. But it's basically like – oh, they lost to Maryland, who now has two. Right, so Washington's yeah. undefeated. And so it's like – I guess the, it's like basically the same as Maryland, whereas like they're, they've only lost like five or six games. They haven't lost to anyone. The worst thing they've lost to is Rutgers, I guess. And yeah. they're five and two. So this Michigan State team, I'm not saying they're going to run the table, but they could still win like five games, and we won't be that surprised. Well, they yeah. finish, we really – I mean, I'm just – the math's all off in my head, but it's like – they're because I was looking at all these different teams and who they've lost to. Yeah. And like Rutgers is back end stretch. The last four games are against – Teams that have a combined, you know, Iowa's lost a couple games and Maryland's lost two games now. So Rutgers' last four games are the toughest in the country for sure, mathematically speaking. Yeah. So, you know, if Get you can win one. Get it done now. And, right, we and Maryland looks a lot more beatable too. Is, True. Is they looked – they slept walk through that game. I think it's going to come back and be like, okay, that's the worst game they played all year. But that game suddenly looks more winnable than it did a week ago. A week ago, we were like, there's no way they'll win. And now we're yeah. like, well, maybe. Well, well, Maryland to me is very different in the sense that I think that Rutgers actually matches up pretty well in the trenches, where I think talent-wise at the skill positions, Maryland is is above. But oh. if you start to have injuries where key guys are out for Maryland, all of a sudden, and that's kind of what happened two years ago, Rutgers was able to win barely, but they still won, where I think that that game is – I hope that game is always the last game of the season because it's always going to be a wild card X-Factor game. Exactly. I think health is going to play so much into who wins year after year. Yeah, well, that's why those games should be the last game of the season. Yes. Because, like we saw, unfortunately, when we talked, knock on wood, Maryland in 2015 – Rutgers had a huge win. They were huge. They were winning huge. And then Maryland was reeling. They had an interim staff. They hadn't won a game in like two months. And Rutgers decided, hey, let's just run it into the line, even though we're throwing all over them. And then they blew it. That was like, the closing act of the Kyle Flood era. But it was also payback for the year before because they had a wild comeback. At yeah, but both teams were good the year before. Yeah. Like, if Rutgers would have won that game in the lap, they would have been five and seven. They, I think they had the APR score. They would have gotten to a bowl game. It would have been a pretty weak bowl attempt, but like you should never blow that game. Like that was kind of, but that's why it should be the last game because you want that team against your rival, which again, like we haven't had enough close games for it to really be a rivalry, but Maryland doesn't have any of their rival anyway. So like it's, it's who knows what will happen. And then the injuries, right? Like, Rutgers beat them because they had a backup quarterback, not only, because their backup quarterback actually played pretty well. Same thing in 2017. It was their fourth or fifth string quarterback in at the end of the game, Brand, after Bortenschlager got injured. Like, but no no one's going to be like, oh, yeah, Rutgers, your three Big Ten wins in 2017 don't count because you face a backup quarterback in Maryland. Like, nobody cares about that, except for Maryland fans, right? So, Are, Are there Maryland fans? Well, the turtle <laughs> shell was not that I should be talking. I mean, that, that game was wild. Did you see it? 
I, I did. I no. I, I was too consumed with the, with the coverage of this one, and I, I was just in a, a you know a fog. So no, I I, I saw that when you texted me about it. Then I saw, and uh, I I couldn't believe that they they lost that game. Well, then they came back, and then they still blew it. Yeah, like, it was. And it was, Illinois was, is not good. Well, but the thing is, and I I mean we'll talk more about this the rest of the season. Illinois did what you have to do against a team like that. They played press man coverage, and were like. Hey, if you can, if you're out, guys can out athlete us. Do it. But Maryland has kind of fallen into that classic Ohio State quarterback trap, where they're so used to their guys being wide open that yeah. when the guys are not wide open, they're like kind of he, he was kind of hesitant. But it happens and, every year. They start. They always start out four zero, and then they start to get beat up at the end of October. Right. Well, they, they September Maryland is obviously a huge running yeah. joke on off tackle empire, especially you know in the last two weeks, but. It's so true in this situation where you're so comfortable in, okay, we've, this is how we're going to play. And then if the other team just takes it to you, like that can happen. And then they were also on an emotional low because they expected to beat Ohio state rightfully or wrongfully. Yeah. They expected to win two weeks ago and they, this was a trap game. And again, Illinois did what they got destroyed by Nebraska, but they played this game to win Illinois. And that's where, you know, we can talk about how some people in the pro- around Rutgers wanted Bielema as their coach. They look awful until all of a sudden they play one of the best teams on their schedule and they win. But it was because they played to win. And that's what I'm hoping to see from Rutgers in the back half of the season. Because, yeah. you know, Michigan State and Rutgers in this game, they both played a conservative, like we talked about. Both teams were in a cover two. They were trying to just stop the run with four in the on the line. No minimal run blitzing. And – that's why both offenses, I think, moved the ball early in the game. But then late in the game, Michigan State was caught in a quagmire because they were like, well, Rutgers is able to pass it. And then they were starting to gamble on the gaps they were running, run, trying to run stuff. And Manung guy it was just so patient. He would just run into the line. They couldn't see him. And then he would look for space and then run around the outside. Like, yeah. they, they, I don't know what – you know, they could have done, but Rutgers needs to kind of do that. Like, I understand you don't, again, in this game, you played cover two at the beginning. You were willing to give up a backup quarterback, let her make mistakes. But as the season moves forward, you're going to have to try to win. That's how you get signature wins. You don't back into signature wins. Like that's a discussion for another day because obviously Indiana is, I expect more of the same of what we saw this past week. And we'll talk more about it and later in the week, but I mean, the, the college football is wild. And the closing thing I want to say, as I know we've run a little bit long, is like that was a really exciting Saturday of college football. And you just want to be a part of it. Yep. You just want to be in the mix. And these type of wins are what show the national perception, your own fan base, that like we're in the mix. Obviously in the locker room, they already think they can win every game like they should. But for everybody else as a fan, you're like, we just want to be a part of this amazing thing that is still college football. I don't know if it's going to last forever, but this is the type of game that is what college football is all about. And having a season where you're just hanging around for a bowl game is what it's all about too. I couldn't have said it better. Uh, my last comment first, you know, just in terms of all we've said is, you know, wanting to have a seat at the table, being in the big 10, but you also want to be talked about at that table when you're there. And like you said, this win gets them talked about. It was a crazy college football ga- uh, day on Saturday, and Rutgers was one part of the story. So relevancy is so important to everything that we've been talking about as well. And your last point to playing the win and being a little bit more aggressive, uh, something I want to table and uh, hopefully we can talk about next week is if they do beat Indiana and they do have six wins and you go into that brutal November schedule, do we see – a little bit of a change and Rutgers does get more aggressive going into those opponents where, you know, it, it's going to be a long shot, but maybe they do take some chances that they wouldn't normally do if they only had five wins, uh, you know, right. against an Iowa per se that maybe can get them over that hump to get that signature win. Maryland's off, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens there. Right. But anyway, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see if a six and two Rutgers team goes into November with a loaded schedule, but maybe we see a little bit of, you know, uh, more aggressiveness in how they attack it. We'll see. Thank you so much for all your insight. Thank you for listening and watching once again. We'll be back later in the week to give a full preview on Indiana and check out all of my coverage at the scarlet 
Have a great day. Talk to you tomorrow.